It is good to be together. It is good to see each other, like actually see each other, isn't it? You know, I'm excited to be here in this room with you and with all of our campuses and also everybody that's online. And this is a, a new reality that God has been building, and so we're just excited to be together as a church in lots and lots of places. You know, thousands of years ago, when God came up with this idea of church, and the word church just simply means assembly. It means gathering. And God had an imagination that his people should gather together. And as they gathered together, his imagination wasn't that we would sing some songs and maybe get some information we didn't have. His imagination was that we would actually be able to encounter him. And that we would be able to experience his goodness and greatness and his wisdom and his grace. And that's what this is. Whether you're at your kitchen table or in your living room or in one of our auditoriums, I believe right now that God's imagination for this space in this time is nothing other than encountering him. And my prayer this morning is that we will. My prayer is that we will have in a sense that God puts a thought in our mind or that God puts a feeling in our heart or that there's some way, shape, or form that we know that we have been with him. And as that's true, my hope is that that will actually change us, maybe just in a really small way, right? Maybe not, maybe in a bigger way. And so if you join me right now, I'd love to pray for that. I'd love to pray for God's presence to be a part of this and that this not just a time of doing things together, but it's a time of relationally encountering God. Would you pray with me? Father, we're just so grateful for all that you do. We're faithful that you had an imagination for life with you in COVID before we were ever born. And Lord, I just thank you for your goodness, and I thank you that you're here, that you're around every dining room table, that you're in every living room, that you're in every auditorium, that your presence is here, that you love us, and you're here for no other reason but to hang with us and be with us. And we thank you for that. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have been in a series around the life of the apostle Peter. And there's lots of folks that we could talk about, right? But I gotta tell you, Peter's one of my all-time faves. I don't know how you like him or not. I love Peter. I can relate to Peter. Peter is a person of high highs and low lows. Is this true? Peter's a person that like has some really big wins and then man, it's just like all a downhill run, right? This is, this is something I can understand. Peter is so relatable. He's someone who loves Jesus with all his heart, who gets lots wrong, but in the end, figures it out. And I love that about him. We're gonna actually talk about a moment in Peter's life that's actually my favorite moment. Um, it's the favorite moment that I have gotten a chance to read about for him. It's a moment that he never saw coming. It is a moment he couldn't have predicted and would have never had the imagination to realize it would change his life forever. It's a moment where Jesus invites him into more than he could imagine and allows him to experience a life that he probably never even dreamed of. If you have your Bibles, uh, flip them open with me to Matthew chapter 14. If you're at home and, and you don't have it, go, go grab it. and Because uh, I'm going to just kind of read through the whole chapter with you. I'm actually going to tell it more than read it. But follow along with me. Chapter 14 begins with an event, actually a pretty sad event. Uh, chapter 14 begins with the death of John the Baptist at the hand of King Herod. John, who was a wonderful man, he was one of the greatest men who ever lived, who was the forerunner for Jesus, was killed, was murdered because of his allegiance for God and his speaking about the kingdom of God. And we're told that when Jesus hears of John's death, he is overwhelmed by grief. He loves John. John's a close friend. And it, it burdened his heart. And when he heard about it, he desired to withdraw away from all of the crowds and just be alone with the Father and pray. And see, this was a moment in time where Jesus was never alone. If you're the mother of small children, you know exactly how that feels, right? You are never alone. In this moment in Jesus' life, there were thousands of people that literally followed him everywhere. Every day, 
from the beginning of the day to the end of the day. Thousands and thousands of people followed him around. And he needed to withdraw from that. And so he told the disciples, get in a boat and we're going to sail all the way to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And so they did. And the crowd saw them leaving and they did something that I don't think people anticipated. They actually walked 18 miles all the way around to meet Jesus on the other side. Thousands and thousands of them. Now, when Jesus sees them streaming in, he has compassion on them. His heart goes out to them because they arrive as you would imagine they would arrive, right? Tired and hungry and worn out, but they want more of Jesus. They want to hear what he's going to say. They want to see what he's going to do. They are experiencing God in a way that they hadn't before, and they want more of that. And so he has compassion on them, and he sets aside his own priorities and what he wants to do. He forgets about being alone, and he gathers them unto himself. Right? He helps them organize, they get them all brought in, and they get everybody seated, thousands and thousands of them. There are 5,000 men and their wives and children, so probably at least 10,000 people that they get to come and they, they order around. And so Jesus takes some time, and he teaches them again about the kingdom of God. And then he asks, is anyone sick? Does anyone have a problem? Does anyone need God to show up in a powerful way? And everybody who raised their hand, he prayed for them, and they were healed. You can imagine how long that might have taken, right? I mean, I'm guessing this is an all-day thing, right? And in the end, he realizes what? They're hungry. So he calls the 12 together and he goes, hey, feed them. Now, they respond in the way that the 12 often respond to Jesus when he says stuff like that, right? They're like, you've got to be kidding. You've got to be kidding. Have you looked at them? Do you see how many of these people there are? Jesus, we barely brought enough for us. Like, we have five loaves of bread and two fish, and the fish aren't even that big. And Jesus says, just bring it all to me. So they bring him the five loaves of two fish, and he breaks it up, right? And he blesses that. And then he says, just start handing it out. They're like, okay, whatever you say. So they're handing it out. And lo and behold, you know the story, right? It multiplies. And not only is it enough, it's more than enough. And everybody eats their fill in this huge crowd. And at the end, there are 12 full baskets of food left over that people were too full to eat. A whole basket for each of the 12. There's a lesson there, don't you think? That in God's kingdom, what we think is impossible might be possible. And that there's God, for God, scarcity can become abundance just with his presence. Now, Jesus realizes that the 12 didn't get this as well as he would have liked. And so he tried to think of how to help them. And so he asked them to get back in the boat without him and sail back all the way across the Sea of Galilee from where they started. And he said, I'm going to go up on the mountain tonight and pray I'll meet up with you, right? And the general idea was, you sail over, I'll walk around, we'll, we'll meet up. Well, I don't know what he prayed for on the mountain that night. Likely, he prayed to the Father about his friend John and the death that came. And He might have prayed about some of the needs of the people that he ministered to that were still on his mind and his heart. He might have even prayed about his own coming death. But one thing I think is fairly likely that he did pray about was he probably prayed for a storm because one came out of nowhere. The disciples, who again were experienced fishermen, they, they knew boats, they knew the sea, and they're heading back on a very clear, beautiful night, and a storm comes up, and not a small storm, not a little squall, right? A huge storm, a violent storm, a fierce storm, and it hits them, and in fact, it hits their tiny boat with such a terrible fury that it's overwhelming. Uh, the waves are so big and the wind is so strong, they have to take the sail down. And they're rowing in any direction and they can't move. The boat will not move because the wind and the waves are there and it's swamping the boat. It is breaking the boat up and water is coming in and they are furiously rowing and bailing 
for nine hours. Nine hours. What is the hardest physical thing you have ever done for nine hours? I don't know that I have one. I was trying to think of something here, and I'm like, I don't think I've done something really hard and physical like that for nine hours. But the reality is, that's a long time, isn't it? Think about the shape that they're in. These guys are strong. They're, they're, they're working men. But nine hours furiously rowing and bailing, you're exhausted, right? Your strength is gone. You are physically overwhelmed, and you are, are tapped out. You also are scared to death. Nine hours is a long time to be scared. Can I get an amen? 30 seconds can be a long time to be scared, right? Nine hours is a long time to be scared. It's like things happen to us when we're scared that long, right? I'm guessing hope for them began to leak and probably leaked a lot to the point of where they were exhausted and terrified and felt hopeless. They looked at this storm and they said, it's so big and I feel so small. It's so powerful that I feel powerless. And that's where they were. About 3 a.m., Jesus decides to go get him. And so he walks down from wherever he was praying on the mountain. And instead of walking around the lake, like we would imagine... What does he do? Walks on it. Who saw that coming, right? So Jesus goes walking out in the midst of the storm, the wind and the waves, right? He's walking right through it. And as he gets close to the boat, this is what they say. This is in, in verse 26. It says, when the disciples saw him, meaning Jesus, walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. And they cried out in fear, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And I'm going to stop there. A better translation of that might be this, fear not, for I am. Like if you literally translated the Greek into that, it would be fear not, for I am. And you say, okay, well that's kind of an awkward sentence, and I see why they translated it that way, Scott. Got it. However, if you were a Hebrew in the day of Jesus, that might have meant something different to you. Fear not, because I am. Remember when Moses asked God his name? And he said, hey, I'm going to go before Pharaoh, and I'm going to tell him to do all the stuff you're telling me to do, and he's going to ask me what God sends me. So can I tell tell him your name? And what does God say his name is to Moses? I am. I am. What else can God be called? Because any name that God would have would limit him more than who he actually is. And he just said, well, I am that I am. Tell him I am sent you. And so for all the Hebrew people, they know God by his most intimate name, the name that he gave Moses, is the most holy, sacred name of God that they have. I am. Those 12 would have known exactly what Jesus was saying. He was saying, you don't have to be afraid because the great God of the Bible, I am, is with you. Something greater than the storm had come. And his name was Jesus. That blows them away, right? And as he approaches the boat, The disciples respond the way you would imagine they would. They're amazed, right? They're like, wow. And they're relieved. Thank goodness Jesus is here, right? Get this situation under control, man. But Peter is the only one that's having something different happen inside him. Somewhere along the way, he has this brilliant flash, man. It's like lightning, right, that hits his mind. I mean, this is a moment... Of where Peter is actually perceiving something, the other 11 are not. And he, he starts off, I think, by thinking this. I wonder if this whole storm and Jesus walking here isn't random. 
I'm wondering if this is intentional. Is Jesus trying to teach us something? Is he trying to show us something? And if he is, what is it? And as his mind is whirling, it comes to him. I wonder if Jesus has a purpose, if it's less about showing us how amazing he is, and it's more about inviting us to follow him into it. That's a bold thought, isn't it? I don't know that I'd have thought of that, to be entirely honest with you, sitting in the midst of all of that. But Peter does. Peter might have been still thinking about the five loaves and the two fish, realizing there was something in that that he didn't get, and they, the rest of them didn't get that Jesus was trying to show. And he's saying, I'm wondering if this is the same lesson. And in that moment, he calls out to Jesus, and this is what he says. He says, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come out to you on the water. Smart idea, don't you think? There's some wisdom in this. There's lots of reasons why that's pretty smart. Like, if Jesus would have said, no, you idiot, right? I mean, that, I mean this would be good to know up front, would it not? Like, you'd want to know that piece of information, right, before you, like, jump out of the boat. Because you're going to risk your entire life by doing this. So it's good to kind of check in. The other thing that Peter knew is this isn't a stunt. Meaning this isn't about Jesus sharing his superpowers. He knew this was about the kingdom of God. And it was about following the king. And he wanted to be obedient as much as he wanted to be wise. And so he asked that question. He says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out to you on the water. Come. Come. Jesus says, and Peter got down out of the boat and walked on water and came toward Jesus. Wow, that's pretty amazing, don't you think? I mean, that is an incredible moment. I mean, how much faith do you think that took? How much courage do you think that took? This is one of the bravest things I think I've ever heard of. He actually has this moment of where he calls that out and Jesus says, yes! You got it. Come on out. Well, now he's got to back the play, right? This was a really great idea, but now all of a sudden you got to actually get out of the boat. And so he goes to the side and he swings his legs out. And there's a moment of truth here, isn't there? I mean, think about this. There's a moment where you're all in on this, right? You can't be tiptoed in. You're going to be all in. There's a moment when he throws his weight forward off the boat and plants his feet. And when he does... They support him. Oh my goodness. I'm walking on water, right? How cool is this? See, in that moment, so often when people talk about walking on water, particularly sarcastically, when they say, well, what do you think you can walk on water? What do they mean? Do you think you're God, right? Is what they mean by that. What they don't realize is Jesus isn't the only person to walk on water, is he? There was actually someone else that did <laughs> And it was Peter. How amazing is that? I mean, it blows my mind that not only he would think of it, but that Jesus would want it. And in the midst of it, it would actually happen. Well, in verse 30, we're told that it didn't last too long. Um, it says, Peter gets out there, right? And he's being Peter, right? Right? And he says, when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, I love that word inserted there, immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. He says, you have little faith, he said. Why do you doubt? And then they climbed back into the boat and the wind died down. And those who were in the boat, meaning the other 11, worshiped him, meaning Jesus, saying, truly, you are the son of God. Amazing, isn't it? So Peter gets out there, he's walking on water, and at some point he looks around and he realizes, wow, there's still waves and wind. And all of a sudden he takes his focus off of following Jesus and puts his focus on the storm. And in that moment, faith turns to fear. And as faith turns to fear, he starts to sink. I don't know how fast that was or not, but it was fast enough he was freaked, right? And I get the impression Jesus was pretty close and just kind of reaches over. I don't know how far down Peter got, but I imagine he maybe he got nose deep in that. And Jesus kind of grabs him, picks him up, right? Puts him on top of the water. And they walk back to the boat. 
And Jesus looks at him and says, oh my gosh, you had it, you were there, man. You were doing it. You were this close. Why'd you doubt, man, you had it. Right, I don't sense tons of condemnation here from Jesus. He's excited about it. They both climb back into the boat, and when they climb into the boat, the storm stops immediately. Done. Think about that. And in that moment, the other 11 are looking at this, and they're like, oh my gosh, surely you are the son of God. I mean, what an incredible adventure for Peter, right? Oh my goodness. Think about that. I mean, talk about a moment that redefines everything, right? Do you think Peter's life was the same again? Like, how do you go back to the way things were after you walk on water? Seriously, right? How do you go back to that? How do you go back to wherever you were, man? I, can't, I couldn't imagine doing that. Every puddle I ever saw, I'd have tried it again, right? I would have seen, you know, how we can do this, right? I'd have been like all over that. And, I, and I, you know, I'm looking at that and I'm thinking to myself, if you're the other 11, you're saying, oh man, I wish I'd have thought of that, right? I mean, if that were me and I had walked on water, I would bore people to tears at every single party retelling this story forever, right? You'd tell me all about your job and I'm like, yeah, 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 that's nice. But you know what? I walked on water. It's true, my girls would roll their eyes, my wife would go get something in the kitchen, and I wouldn't stop because I would tell the story again and again and again because I walked on water. How amazing is that? How many of you have ever walked on water? Well, then, let me tell you again. This is the story, right? It's amazing. It's life-changing. Here's the thing. Walking on water was a way that Jesus could invite Peter into something that he'd been trying to get the 12 into for a long time. He'd been trying to get them to understand a different way of thinking, a different way of seeing than what they ever had. There's a ton in this passage, and if we had another hour, I would love to unpack it for you, and I would love to show all the things that are in this, because it's really pretty remarkable. But there's two things in particular, two observations that I just want to hit And the first is this, storms still rage. Can we agree? Storms still rage. This wasn't the last storm that ever hit anybody. Uh, Storms still rage. The storm in this passage represents an overwhelming obstacle, an opposition that has come against them that they didn't necessarily deserve or, or do something bad in order for it to happen, but it just came as part of a fallen world, but it came with such fury that they were powerless before it. I don't know about you, But over the past several months, this has felt like a nonstop storm for me. Um, It has felt like storm after storm after storm. In times, it's felt pretty overwhelming. And honestly, I have felt pretty powerless. And I don't do powerless well. Can I just say that? I just don't. And in those moments, I am left looking for hope. I am left looking for God. I am left looking for a solution. I am left looking for a future that is not this. And I'm guessing for some of us, we've had a storm of issues around our health that maybe have freaked us out. COVID for sure, but there's a lot of other folks that are going through other types of medical issues in our church too. A lot of us are having to reimagine our career Because like one out of five of us over this period of time lost our job. That's a big number, isn't it? Others of us are having to rebuild our finances. And we had to do things we didn't plan on doing to try to figure out how to get through this. Or maybe, you know, we had just started a business or we were involved in something and it's just not what we imagined at this point in time. Others of us are just trying to recover our way of life. There was a way of life that we had built that we liked. There were things we did together that were fun. There was a way that we supported our family and our kids that was there that's no longer there right now. And we're asking the question, how long can we continue to do it? There's a lot of loss right now. There's fear right now too, isn't there? There's fear about these things, there's just fear. Sometimes there's so much fear that we just learn to live with fear. Did you ever do that? 
that the fear just doesn't go away and you wake up with it again tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Storms. Storms still rage. But I think one of the great hopes that this passage offers us is that no matter how big or how fierce the storms are, no matter how high the waves may be or how fast the winds may come, we can know that something greater than what we face has entered the world. And the presence of Jesus remains. We are not alone. We can have hope right in the midst. <clears throat> See, being a God follower doesn't mean that we don't have storms. We live in a fallen world where people mess up, where nature doesn't do what it's supposed to do, where there's spiritual entities that are adversaries to God. It's all a mess. But God meets us right in the midst of the storm. And he shows us what we could never see apart from the storm, that he is greater than anything we face. The Bible puts it this way. He who is in us, meaning the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, is greater than he who is in the world, meaning the enemy and everything that the enemy can throw. That is the hope of every Christian. And it's the hope that we can have in the midst of all of the craziness that we face. You're not in this by yourself. You're not alone. You've not been abandoned. God knows you. He knows your name. He sees your life. And he's not far from you. But he's actually close. We can so be like Peter, can't we? That the wind and the waves can be all that we see. It's so easy. But in this moment, it's a great moment to remember that God is here too, in the midst, and greater than anything we know. Well, the second thing that I think this passage shares with us is that Jesus still invites us into the unthinkable in order to redefine the impossible. Let me say that again. I think that Jesus still is in the business of inviting us into the unthinkable in order to redefine impossible. You know, if you were out in that storm that night and you were in the boat with the 12 and bailing as furiously as you can and manning an oar and doing everything you could and Jesus is calling you into the wind and the waves, I think we can say a hearty amen that that is unthinkable. It's unthinkable to leave a boat and go into water right in the midst of storm. Um, I've never been in a storm that big on a boat. I've been in small storms. And I'll tell you, to me, it was unthinkable to get out of that boat even in a small storm. In the midst of the raging tyrant that is there, to get out of the boat is unthinkable. But here's the thing. The gift that Jesus offers doesn't exist in the boat. It exists in the wind and the waves. He's not in the boat. He's out there. And if we're willing to do the unthinkable, he will redefine impossible for us. Because it's unthinkable to get out of a boat, but it's also impossible to walk on water. But Peter learned that both aren't true. Last week, we talked about Jesus in the transfiguration of where his, he physically changed into his divine form so that Peter, James, and John could see who he is and is the fully divine, fully human, one and only son of God. And, and out of Jesus' humanity and divinity, Jesus does unique things. Jesus does things that no other person does. Can we get an amen? Transfiguration. Nobody else transfigures, by the way, right? Crucifixion. He's the only person that can pay for the sins of mankind. Resurrection. Who else can bring eternal life but Jesus? You and I can't. And the ascension into heaven, nobody else put a crown on, has a crown on their head and is the king of kings and lord of lords. That is Jesus and Jesus alone. No one but Jesus. And Jesus never asks anyone to do that, does he? When we look at everything that Jesus asks in the New Testament, we see he never asks the 12 to do any of those things. That's something he's going to do for them and for us. But 
there's an awful lot that he does ask of them. There's an awful lot he does invite them into, isn't there? He invites them into the life that he's living. You see, it's true that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, fully divine, fully human, but he also has chosen to do life and ministry not through his own strength, as a choice, right? He could have, as a choice, he chooses to work through the presence of the Holy Spirit, which he fully intends to give to the 12, to show them the life of the kingdom that they can live. And that's what's happening here. You see, this is a moment where the gospel is important. The message that Jesus shared with everybody is repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, meaning the kingdom has come into the world. Pay attention, change your mind, turn around, get a hold of what this is because it's the most important thing that there is. And you can live out of that kingdom a different life. The gospel, in a very real way, is a new way to live. It's a new way to be human. It's a new way to do society. And it redefines what's impossible, doesn't it? You see, when we live out of God's presence in our life, it's not about getting superpowers so we can go do whatever we want. In fact, God doesn't do that. Uh, the kingdom of God is about God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what Jesus says. And that's what God empowers. In any circumstance you're in, in any situation in which you find yourself, if you can figure out what God's will is on earth as it is in heaven, he'll back that play. That's what he'll get behind. And we're told that there's lots of parts of his presence that he'll give us, right? I mean, he gives us his genius, right? His wisdom. We're told in the book of James, we can ask God anything and he'll tell us. That's a pretty good deal. I don't know if you've thought about that or not, right? But that covers a lot of ground. I was in four circumstances this week where I was trying to referee conflict between two people. Can we all agree that in Illinois right now we have more conflict than corn, right? Can we, can we agree on that, right? We are in conflict, man. And there's conflict all over the place. And there was four different situations which I found myself just this week of where really good, godly people who love Jesus and love each other and are, are amazing were in conflict with each other and couldn't find their way out of it. And my job was to try to figure out how to get them to actually see each other for who they are, get past the circumstances they're in, and be able to find not just agreement, but goodness on the other side of that. And I'll be honest with you. As I listened to these people talk, I had no idea how to do that. Like, I'm not kidding, zero. I'm looking at this, and, and, and from a worldly standpoint, I'm looking at the level of conflict and disagreement, and I'm like, I don't think it's possible. I don't think they want it. And honestly, I have no idea how to navigate that. Each time I went before God and I said, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know. I have no idea how to help these people. And I prayed, and within five minutes each time, a radically different solution came to mind than anything I had ever thought of up to that point in time. And as I presented that to each of these people, I saw the peace of God take root. That's the genius of God. That's how the genius of God works, right? I don't have to be the smartest guy in the world. I just need to know God. Amen? God also gives us his goodness, right? His love and his hope and right, all of the things that he pours into us. How many people have ever experienced the heart of God, right? Anybody have you ever felt like the heart of God? If you haven't, it is unbelievable. Like I often, in times of our worship, I feel the very love and heart of God, and I feel it for me, and I'll feel tears come up in my very German eyes, which just doesn't happen, right? Particularly often for me. Um, and, I, and I feel the sense of God's presence, and I'm moved by that. And I find that I can even be in a relatively faithless place, of where I'm having massive doubts and fears. And in just a few minutes later of experiencing the goodness of God, I'm in a very, very different spot. And I'm able to live out of that. God also gives us his greatness, doesn't he? That's what he did with Peter right here. He, he, the power of God was on Peter and let him do something that was impossible to do. But the grace of God is also given. I actually love the fact that Peter failed. I think that's awesome. And I'll tell you why. 
we get a chance to see what Jesus does. And we see grace in action, don't we? He says, save me, I've blown it, I messed up. Jesus doesn't say, well, should have thought of that before you got out of the boat, right? No, he goes over and he grabs him, he saves him. It's like, you knucklehead, you were that close, right? And we see the heart of Jesus in that, which tells me I don't have to get it right all the time. It tells me I don't have to be perfect. It tells me I don't have to have my life all cleaned up and ready to go in order for God to love me or to want to work with me or to give me another chance. Thank God for that, right? But that's what it looks like to live out of the presence of God. We get to live through his genius, his goodness, his greatness, and his grace. Through the presence of the Holy Spirit in you and in me. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? And see, that was Peter's flash of insight. He knew that's what he failed to understand with the loaves and the fish. And he got it in the storm, and it changed his life forever. You know, so often when people read this passage, they imagine that the storm is the greatest threat that the disciples face. And it's understandable why you would think that, right? I would offer that the boat might actually be the greatest threat that the disciples faced because it represented a point other than Jesus that they could derive the illusion of comfort and safety from. If Jesus doesn't come along, what happens to the boat? Is this a hard equation? Can we, can we agree on this? It sinks. This is how boats sink. Boats take on water, boats break. Crews get exhausted and they can no longer row and boats sink. That's what it is like. And that's what was going to happen. Any safety that they imagined they got from the boat was temporary at best and an illusion at worst. Any comfort they got from the boat pales in comparison to the comfort they would get from Jesus. The safest place for the 12 is where? In the wind and the waves with Jesus because he's the one that can keep them safe and strong, not the boat. You know, in the midst of all that life is throwing at us right now, and it's throwing a lot, what is it for you right now? If you were to define the storm in your life at this minute, what might it be? Is it COVID? Is it the, the social climate that we find ourselves in? Is it financial? Is it family? Is it arguing? Is it resources? Health concerns? What is the storm that you face? Think about it right now. What is that? And is whatever it is, and as powerless or small as you may feel, this passage speaks to a hope, a hope that is not diminished by the size of the challenge, a hope that is not vanquished by the ferocity of what we face, a hope that something greater has come into the world and his name is Jesus, and everything has changed. That is your hope. The presence of God is with you, and Jesus is inviting you into his life. He's inviting you into the unthinkable in order to redefine impossible for you. He's inviting you out of the boat. He is inviting you into the wind and the waves, into the rough and the tumble of life with him to do the unthinkable, which is to live by faith in order to redefine impossible. See, there's a life that he wants to give us his life. And we can't know it from the boat. You're never going to know the life of Jesus from the boat. You're never going to know the life where God thrives in you, pulsates through you, changes you, and changes the world around you from the boat. You're not going to know it until you do the unthinkable, which is to actually do what Jesus says and to go with him. But once we are willing to do the unthinkable, he'll redefine impossible. And things we thought are absolutely off the table won't feel that way anymore because God is living with us, around us, in us, and through us. Let me ask you a question. 
what is the boat for you right now? What is that? Right? We all have a boat. Can we say that? There's something in all of our life, and I don't mean this isn't a shame thing, right? There's something in all of our life that keeps us from saying a blanket yes to Jesus. That keeps us from saying, whatever you say, done it, right? Here's a good Bible study for you. Go through the four gospels and just write down everything Jesus ever asked of somebody. How long do you think it will take you to get to unthinkable? Not real long. But in the unthinkable, which parts of that do you say, man, I don't know that I can do that? I don't know that I can say yes in terms of my marriage. I don't know that I wanna be that person in my family. I don't know that I can say yes financially to God because I know the generosity part of that that he's gonna demand and I don't know that I have to do it. I don't know that I, I really want to risk my job or risk my friendships or risk hardship for Jesus. I'd rather have comfort or safety apart from him. That may be the boat. Sometimes fear of failure, right, can be the boat for us. We're so scared we're gonna get it wrong or fail, we don't try. Other times we're afraid to be embarrassed in front of others. Other times we actually wonder if Jesus is actually gonna be there for us. For us, Jesus is a church thing. Jesus is real for us on Sunday. But we really wonder, is he gonna show up on Wednesday? Because I actually really need him on Wednesday. It's true for all of us. All of us wrestle with this, right? But what is the boat for you? What is it in your life that stops you from saying yes? Yes, I'm gonna obey you. Yes, I'm gonna forgive the person I can't stand, right? Yes, I'm gonna love someone who doesn't love me back. Yes, I'm gonna be generous to people who frankly will never say thank you. Yes, I'm going to live a life of radical obedience and I don't care how it ends up. Yes, I trust you with my past. I believe I'm forgiven. Yes, I trust you with my future. Yes, Jesus, yes, and yes again. What is it that stops us from just being able to say whatever you say, yes? That's the boat. Right now, I would love to just take some time and ask God about that. As you think of what that may be in your life, let's take a minute to process that with him. Let's take a minute to have an imagination, an imagination for a life that is from God that we can't make, that invites us into the unthinkable in order to redefine the impossible. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace and your greatness, Lord, and the genius that you give us. Lord, we all should confess probably our imagination is too small and we haven't conceived of the life that you actually are offering. And Lord, so much does feel impossible to us. So much of what we read, Lord, in your book feels impossible because we haven't seen it. And Lord, so much of what you ask feels unthinkable, it feels hard, it feels way too much. Lord, help us to know your goodness and that you're real and that you're there and that you've got us and that you're gonna grab us when we fail and you're gonna pick us up and carry us if you have to. Help us to know that you know us, that you love us and that you are absolutely present. And Lord, help us to get rid of our boat and have the courage to step into the wind and the waves and to allow you to find reality as only you can. We love you and we pray this in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.